was your toughest day on set? Oh, a lot of tough days. A lot of tough days to watch. Men, it's one thing. Something happening to me, it's one thing. But to watch Kerry Washington. And uh, there was a situation where when the scene came, and we've all sort of known the scene about, you've always, in slavery, you always think of the whip and someone being whipped, but for Kerry to be whipped, most courageous person in this movie was Carrie Washington. She said, I want to be hit with the lashes. We were actually at the plantation in New Orleans where there's a real plantation. This is the grounds where ancestors really walked. Quentin does a fantastic thing where he would play music in between scenes. And that day, I went to the music guy and said, listen, I got three songs I want you to play. Um, and they set the speakers up throughout the whole, imagine this whole thing is, is Shack Road, this whole big area. And there's big speakers in every corner. And they shoot m my point of view first. So Carrie's actually to my, to my right, waiting for her scene. And the amount of emotions that I was feeling was just, I couldn't, I couldn't hold it. And then when she actually began the, the whipping scene, there was a song by Fred Hammond, who's a religious uh, gospel singer. And the song was, No weapons formed against me shall prosper. And when that would play, play throughout the whole Shack Village, I saw uh, one of the extras who had a little kid, I saw her hands go up. And she started like, you know, I guess you would call it testifying or, or you know, really feeling the Holy Ghost. And I watched Quentin, who is super director, who is super, you know, we're gonna get this shot done. And I see him do this and water had filled up in his eyepiece you know, because he was crying. And that was probably the most challenging time, but a testament to Quentin Tarantino and his ability to understand the situation. He went to every single person on that set, whether they were extras or, or main characters, and made sure they were okay between each scene. And I think that's what made it tough, but he'd crack a joke, he'd play some different music, get your mind off things, and uh, it, you know, that was one of the toughest uh, things to, to, to watch that and to watch how she embodied it, and I guarantee you when you see it on film, it just takes you to another place. And you say they used a real whip on her at certain point? They used a real whip only it was the, um, it was sort of the nylon version, but she wanted to, she wanted to wow. feel it, which was like, you know, I mean, that's courageous, man. You know, and I'd have been like, hey, man, could y'all give me a stunt back? <laughs> Just go give me a back. Just go give me a whole different back. Because you know I ain't with the, you know. But it was, uh, it was crazy. What was the most fun about playing this part? The most fun about it was being a cowboy. Uh, and I was riding my own horse when I met with Quentin. You know, I, was, I, I mean, to be honest with you, I wanted to play the part. And I was saying, listen, I'm going to put my bed in like nobody else. I know you need somebody to ride a horse. I got a horse about five years ago. I got a couple of horses, you know. And he said, well, if I choose you, could, could you ride? I said, let me ride my own horse. And I said, let, let me ride my own horse to see if she can handle the stunts. And next thing you know, she's able to handle the stunts and everything like that. And so I get a chance to play a cowboy, spin guns like I used to spin plastic guns. And you know, I get the, the, the green jacket from Bonanza. Which being a kid from Texas, that's all we watched was, was Western. You know, green jacket for bananas. You kidding me with the moleskin pants? That's hugging you a little bit. You're hugging, you know, it's hugging you, you know, the whole, the huggies. So uh, um, it was amazing. And, and my horse and I had basically the same arc. Me starting off as this troubled number six slave in the chain gang. And she was a little nervous when we pulled up the, the silks. She would spook like bad. Handler would grab the rein. I said, do me a favor, let go of the rein and just let her find her bearings. So first she would scoop and I would make sure everybody's out of the way. I'd ride her right until she settled. And so as Django settled, so did Cheetah, her name was Cheetah Settle. At the end of the movie, she's so comfortable. We're doing stunts where she has to do the spin. I, I three turns, stops, I'm done does her feet like this. I was like, oh, she's cheesing this. She really, she really trying to get on the magazine. So, uh, that was the fun thing. And the fun thing, too, was the crew. 
Quentin had a thing about it. He says, guys, we got that take. We could stop. But we're going to do another one. You know why? And everybody would go, because we love making movies. <laughs> I was like, what? And they would do that. Whenever you got like tired of it, they would do that. And uh, so to do a movie like this, with this type of uh, heavy material, and have someone like that who was really you know, keeping you from going too far under his bed. One thing, Kerry Washington. The, the horse oh, real quick. You said the name of the horse in the movie, and the actual, my actual horse the name is Cheetah. So and what was girl. the name in the, in the uh, Tony? Tony. Okay. Um, one thing uh, Kerry Washington just said is um, talking about working with Quentin Tarantino being sort of a collaborative thing. But when you watch the film, sometimes you wonder, like, is this just, you know, film schooled to the, you know. Like everything just in its right place, like you know. Did you find it to be a collaborative thing, like also? I found that it was everything. I found that Quentin Tarantino would really use everything, every inspiration to to get his movie in the right place. And then what was amazing was he allowed characters to really grow and develop and sit back and watch where they would go. I think I think watching Leonardo DiCaprio and Quentin work was one of the most amazing things because here comes Leonardo DiCaprio, the good looking guy who you've been seeing on the tabloids with the models and all, and he comes in so different and ready to work and to see those guys get in the corner and develop the character and watch the character go different ways and then once he saw that go different way he go oh now I gotta change this over here for Django's character now I gotta change this for character's character I gotta change this for Samuel's character so he was open to things he had of course the script was already amazing but then he would just on a dime and I don't know if he wants to speak about it but on a dime sometime he would just change I said, can I bring some of my friends down here to watch you work? And at one point, he just rewrote a whole scene. And he said, no, that don't work. The next day he goes to lunch and comes back. Four pages of perfect dialogue. <laughs> I said, this dude is this good. And the next thing you know, we shoot it. And his team was on point, too, because they know how it works. And it was just amazing. And every little question, like if he did something that got to a stop, like... Uh, Samuel Jackson in a situation where I shot six people and now I'm supposed to shoot Samuel Jackson. Samuel goes, ah, ah, ah. I, he, he didn't shot six bullets. And Quinn goes, ah, 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 I got that. <laughs> <laughs> I got that, I got that. Uh, okay, so what's going to happen right here, Samuel, you're going to go, uh, I counted six bullets, motherfucker. <laughs> and then Django's going to pull out another gun and says, I count two guns, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> On the spot goes in the movie, it'll be a classic uh, line. So when, just, when Tarantino announces a project, there's this extreme level of interest that, that like, right to the script, right to the they want to see footage, they want to see as much as possible, and then you have to bring it here with the sizzle reel and show it to fans. How much, how many more surprises and how much of this do you think we've seen and how much more do you guys have up your sleeve? You know, I don't have anything to do with it, but I know one thing that uh, Quentin Tarantino, he thinks to me, like, I, I know it's going to sound weird, but he thinks like a hip-hop artist. And hip-hop artists drop a single, drop something on the internet, leak something over here, dude, because he knows it's hot. Mm -hmm. So he, he knows whatever it is is hot. He knew today that when he showed you that footage, mm -hmm. and he knows his audience, he tapped me on the leg and says, when you were at BET last week, that's your, I know that's your forte. <laughs> Watch me in this. <laughs> and what he doesn't know is that BET is his forte, too, because black folk rock with him all, all the way but when he knew that these were his fans he knew so he's hip hop and that's why I explain I think my thing is is that always letting him know that you're hip hop man and like right now the music world is on fire trying to be the first to be in a Quentin Tarantino film because he usually doesn't do you know scores mm -hmm. but I hope I'm not letting the cat out the bag but John Legend did a song put it on cassette and send it to Quentin because he knows that he doesn't like, uh, you know, uh, technology. Technology. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He puts it on a cassette. He says, I got the song I want you to hear. I said, let me hear it. Let me, let me break out my uh, CD. He said, CD, no, man. <laughs> Pulled out the little the construct, you know, you remember the directorial cassette tape with the two thing? 